we're good to go. Hey, everybody. We finally got this right. So, um, yes, welcome. Uh, this is kind of a spur of the moment thing that uh, I'm doing, and I have my friend Eyal with me. So, how's it going, Eyal? Hello. Yeah, so we were just talking about things earlier, and we just decided that um, we both had this passion to want to do more tutorials and to uh, you know help more people get into audio programming and we thought what's better to do on a Sunday afternoon Sunday evening than uh, talk about object oriented programming talk about C++ yeah. and uh, yeah so uh, so many people in the discord group and by the way if you're not familiar with our uh, audio programmer community you can join us on uh, the audioprogrammer.com forward slash community we have a community that has just broken uh, over 4,000 developers from all around the world and we have everybody from uh, people like Yal who are developing uh, quote-unquote professionally all the way to teenagers that are just typing their first lines of code and just learning how to get into coding and everything in between developers that are doing other types of professional development but they're curious about audio code coding and uh, people that are in university and just it's it's a whole bunch of fun and so yeah so if you want to join us it's completely free you can just join us by going to the audioprogrammer.com forward slash community so, El, uh, what are we going to talk about today? So today I thought that we'll talk a little bit about uh, object oriented, which is uh, a very, very common, uh, you know, writing paradigm or programming paradigm. Uh, there's a bunch of mechanics involved with that paradigm, but I think more than the mechanics, which you kind of have to understand uh, if you want to be a uh, uh, professional programmer specifically in the uh, C++ world. Uh, there's also, I think, a bunch of uh, design concepts that if you uh, know the, the techniques and the reasoning behind them, you can create really cool things in your programs, in your plugins or, or uh, games or whatever it is you're uh, using C++ for. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so so there are different types of design patterns, and um, object oriented is probably one of the most straightforward to to really understand, and it's the type that I use because you have this other type called functional programming, which is way too complicated for me. Uh, I like to stick stick with object oriented and uh, stick to what I know, and and I think that object oriented really works well for a lot of people, especially to start off because the coding is um, the way that it's constructed is in a way that we as humans think of things. We think of objects and, and um, you know, things having different behaviors, you know, like for example, if you think of this video feed, you might have like something that it does like video, uh, you know, video dot stream or video dot stop. And it might have certain attributes to it. Like it might have, uh, you know, a picture. So, uh, you know, you create one picture that's me, one picture that's a yow. And then, so it has these things that, um, kind of construct what it actually is. And then it has, and then you have things that it actually does. And that's how we think of things. You know, when you think of a car, a car has wheels, but a car can drive. So a car is something that we would think of as, uh, what we would call in code, an object, uh, and that encapsulates everything that a car does. Is that is that sound right on? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean object oriented is really a name for a, f a few different things, right? Uh, and by the way, before we keep going, we have uh, our great um, Discord uh, server that we're uh, a lot on. Uh, yeah. This is the audio programmer uh, Discord channel. We might want to post. There yeah. we're starting, yeah. so that we'll have uh, people from the community joining and uh, yeah. also sharing their opinions and, and questions. Yep, absolutely. So I'm just going to share this out on all the social networks. For some introduction. All right. Yeah. 
Um, so while Josh does that, I'll, I'll keep uh, explaining. So there's, uh, uh, before we go into the, the conceptual discussion, and there's a lot of conceptualness going when we're uh, talking about object oriented, uh, it's first of all it's important to explain that object oriented is uh, is a way to organize your code, and doesn't matter if you think that this is the right way to do this or you want to or you want to follow another paradigm. You must understand this way to organize code because a lot of code you're going to encounter is already organized in that way. So it's uh, it's one of those things where uh, you know nowadays when you type type object oriented in Google you'll see questions in Stack Overflow or YouTube videos. Should I use object-oriented, uh, et cetera? But, but really the, the, the practical reason is uh, if you're starting out by using whatever, Juice or Unreal Engine or uh, Qt or any other library, you're immediately in an object-oriented world and you must understand at the very least the, the, the design implications and the mechanics. Right, so I thought today we'll, we'll talk a bit about uh, not everything about object oriented because it's impossible, but just a bit of how things are built and what can you do with them when they're built like that. Yeah, if that makes any sense. Yeah, absolutely. And and like we were saying, for people that are just getting uh, into coding. Uh, when you have code and as your code base, basically as you're building something big, bigger and bigger, then what happens is that the code gets so big that you have to organize it somehow. So object, as Ia was saying before, object-oriented programming just refers to the way that we're actually organizing the, uh, the, our, our actual code. So in this case, object-oriented programming means that we're taking bits of code that kind of belong together that encapsulate uh, a type of behavior. And we're just basically taking it and we're putting it in one place so that uh, it's organized in a way that we as humans are able to relate to. Um, yeah, so so shall we sh start showing them some code, Eo? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, let me open my, uh, my screen here. I got the Discord, uh, the audio programmer Discord channel. Uh, but I'm going to open my favorite uh, IDE, which is C Lion, and I'm just going to open a new C++ kind of hello world project. Uh, this would be a similar process if you're using Xcode, Visual Studio, uh, or any other uh, C++ IDE. Some people like to use the command line, so in that case, it would be a bit more complicated. But the idea is that this is an editing environment, and that kind of the, even though this is a sort of a beginner's uh, course, uh, I'm kind of assuming that everybody who sees this knows about uh, for loops, variables, and really basic uh, functions, maybe, and maybe very basic C stuff. Uh, so, okay. So, first of all, the, the first thing that we have that's basically started out this whole uh, concept of object oriented is uh, something we have from C that's called a struct. I think uh, everybody who's used almost any language is familiar with a struct. Uh, a struct is a way to uh, join together a few types of information. So let's say you wanted to uh, have uh, something like a, a point calculation, something that calculates a point. So uh, in the past, you, uh, you would do something like an int x, int y, right? You'd have two variables. And then anytime you'd have a function that does something, you'd have a, a function that takes whatever. Uh, you want to do uh, get center or get, or maybe you want to get, uh, get a point in a distance or something. And then in a distance. And then you'd ask for an int x, int y. And this can go on and on. Like you keep passing into the functions the x and the y, the x and the y. So in C land, this has a very simple solution. You're saying, okay, this x and y, these two variables, they're a concept. They're called a point, right? So we, we have a struct, it's called a point. And we join together the two variables and int x and y. 
right? And then whenever you wanted to take, have a function that works with a point, you can just pass a point. So this is a, something of type point. And then when I create the point, I can just say a point P and then P dot X equals 50, P point Y equals 20. And then maybe I call the function, you get point in the distance and I pass the point or something. P, P is my point. Right, so this is, this is very, very basic stuff. The idea is that you have a concept, which is the X and the Y, you gave them a name, right, which is the point, and then you've joined them together, and now you can uh, you can pass these in functions. You can store many of them. You can create an array, like I can say here is an array of fifty points if I want to. Uh, so there's a lot you can do with this concept of uh, of the two variables. Uh, and C plus plus took that concept. So this is a uh, the, this is already a bit of a C++ syntax, but this is the same concept as what you've had in C. And uh, instructs, I think, is actually under underused, is an underused concept in the language because there's so much you can do with the struct. Because one thing that happens constantly is, for example, you have this function, and this function now calls another function, right? Uh, so for, ex for example, one function called, let's say, you had a, a calculate, right? A calculate function. And it had an, it takes uh, int, int x and int y. And then you have another function that calls called by that function. So it's more something like a deep calculate, calculate right? And it takes another int x and y. And this, get, this can get, uh, this can get quite deep. This function calls another function, et cetera. And then suddenly you're switching this from, uh, from a 2D to a 3D thing. And now you have to keep changing all your functions to now take a Z, right, in Z. And uh, this can uh, really limit how you're designing things. So a struct is really powerful because once I passed uh, a point into each of these functions, right, and each function, each of those can, can call the other function, calculate can call deep calculate, and I can just add things into the struct, right? Maybe I have another x, maybe I have another point there in x2 or something. So the, this, can get, this can get moved uh, into the function, right? So we didn't have to change the signature of all the functions that we had, we just had to change the struct. And this is, uh, uh, I, think, I feel like a very powerful uh, concept because, uh, because when you define concepts like this, and then when you have, and as you know, structs can also have other structs uh, inside of them. So for example, if a point has an X and a Y, I might have a struct rectangle that has a point of something like upper left corner. And then maybe I have uh, int width and height, right? So. I don't. I didn't have to rebuild this uh, the the x and the y and redeclare them. I already have the the concept of a point, and I can keep reusing it, and I can keep passing now uh, this memory layout, which is the memory of all the variables in in this and the memory that's in the point. I can just pass them along, and I can create an array of those. I can pass them into functions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, th so this is uh, this is a very kind of basic concept. That uh, that everybody are pretty much used to from working with C, but I just thought it was important to uh, to kind of reiterate before we get into uh, what what C plus plus brought when back in the eighties they uh, brought in the concept of object oriented. Hmm. Do you think that we might be able to give them an example of for somebody for for people that are just really starting out something that's a little bit more real world than than point and rectangle like something like a car or like I don't know a uh, yeah like a car might be a good one like a car has like a wheel and the wheel and the car drives or it might stop can can you do one like that? Yeah, I I don't want to go in go into uh, well I will go into that in a second, but yeah. I don't want to 
uh, talk about yet about things that a struct can do. Like in C, struct are really dumb, right? Mm-hmm. Struct were, was defined as just a bunch of data. And then you'd have some function later on that would operate and you could pass the data into the, into the function, right? Mm-hmm. So in C, in C, you didn't have the concept of a car that could do things. But that's actually something that was brought into when, uh, when C++ started. Right, mm-hmm. started, and then the and then people dis, uh, decided that instead of uh, having uh, separate functions and separate data, there's an advantage to uh, to actually chaining the functions along with the data, and this is where I I feel like object oriented is uh, is starting to get interesting. Mm-hmm. So so if we had a dumb struct like here we have a point and here we have a rectangle or something. Uh, so let's, let's uh, remove all this code and let's imagine that we wanna, uh, we wanna do something more interesting with, uh, with the point, right? So let's, let's imagine that what we wanna do is we wanna get something like, uh, or let, let's do something, something like that. Let's say I have a line. I want to, I want to create a struct that's called a line, right? A line has a start, right? And an end, just two points. And I want to get the, the distance between the start and the end, right? Uh, so what I would do is, for example, I would say, hey, I have a line. Line dot start, line let's call it L, right? So L dot start dot X would be zero, right? Maybe the Y would be also zero. Mm-hmm. And the end would be something like, like 10, right? That'd be 10 and the Y would also be 10. And now to calculate this, I need to do I need. I want to maybe get the the dis, the y distance or or the x distance or the overall distance or something like that. So to get this, I I suddenly have to be very wordy, right? I have this line, but now I have to start doing something like uh, l dot. I want to say uh, int distance or something equals l dot n minus dot x minus l dot n minus y. And if I want to also add the y, sorry, that, that x. And if I want to get, this should restart. And if I uh, want to do this over and over, this becomes quite wordy. This is a lot of things to do if I want to keep working with the distance, right? This is the distance of the x. And maybe this is the distance of y, right? And dot y minus L star dot Y. So this is becoming pretty lengthy code if I want to work with distances. So the, one, of the, one of the things that uh, C++ brought was the ability to add functions into structs. So if you see that you keep doing this kind of a calculation, you subtract the, the start from the end, you subtract the X, you subtract the Y, blah, blah, blah. Then maybe you want to chain this into one operation. So maybe, you want to do something like int get distance x, right? And then you calculate it by doing return and dot x minus star dot x. And maybe you do the same thing with a y, right? And now this is a y, not a t. And then whenever you want to, you want to work with the distance, you you have a line, you want to work with distance, you can just do something like O2 uh, distance x equals L dot distance, right? So now you have this utility function that this function knows how to uh, work with the internal data of the class. So I didn't have to uh, write a function and start to uh, passing it all the internals, the x and the y's and everything that's in it. This function can now just uh, can now just uh, work and manipulate the members. So, um, and, and this can get 
uh, more interesting, right? So for example, I can, instead of returning a distance X and a Y, I can say, get distance and return a point, right? So maybe I can do something, I can get the entire distance and then I can create a new point, point distance point and distance point dot X will be get distance X, distance points dot Y is get distance Y. And I can return this distant point. And then whenever I want to get a point that represents the distance in the X and the Y, I can just do, hey, go to distance is distance. So this is kind of a shortcut to working with data because sometimes you'll see that variables have has different uh, different interaction. There's different calculation going between different pieces of data. And once you encapsulate it, you'll see that, let's say I'm starting to reuse this line. I'm having a bunch of lines in my code. This becomes really easy. This becomes some like a very, very simple operation. You can reason about it. Uh, in modern C++, you can actually shorten a lot of a lot of this code. So you can actually do something like, hey, return get distance x, get distance y. Without this and with this. So this is another uh, an, an, another more modern way to do this. <clears throat> so so uh, the idea is that we've encapsulated all the operations from X and Y, X and Y into one thing. And, and this now looks simple because you're like, oh yeah, X and Y, I can do my own X and Y calculations. Why did I need to do this? So this gets more and more interesting when we start to develop bigger structures with, uh, with, uh, with functions and data. Uh, so this, this was just a very, very, uh, like the, the, the most initial concept that you need to understand. For, by the way, many people think that you need the word class to add functions. Uh, that's not true. You can always add, uh, you can always add functions to a struct. That there's, that there, there are differences between struct and a class, but it's not the fact that you can add functions. Mm -hmm. And can you can you just tell people that are really beginning just in int main in int main line thirty uh, when you're constructing the, when you have that line l what what does that mean for people what are you doing there right so whenever you're doing something like this so so the concept of object oriented means that you've we've you've encapsulated some data some variables inside the concept right so a point is an x and a y. A line is two points, start and the end, right? So overall, each point will have an X and a Y uh, that's uh, bound with it. And, and these are, and when you're creating an object, you're basically creating all the memory that was needed for all the different parts of this. So when you're, when you're creating this, you've basically created one point and you create another point and each point created an X and a Y. So, this object is basically all the memory, but it also has all the functions that's associated with this memory. So whenever you're calling the dot operator, right, you're accessing the memory or you're accessing the functions that you've created that talk to uh, this particular instance. So for example, if I had a, uh, if you have a few instances, like if you have, uh, like for example, maybe you have, uh, let's remove all this stuff. So you can have lines that's called start and a line that's called end. And you can, you can keep creating a bunch of lines. Uh, each of those will have individual memory, individual, uh, so individual chunk of memory that's associated with this particular instance. So, uh, so to, to simplify things, this is not the, the actual object. This is the object, right? What this is, what line is, and what point is, they're descriptions on how the memory layout and the functions related to this memory look like when you want to create an object. And this is a kind of an important concept, I guess, which I, I forgot to, uh, to mention. So uh, if I didn't do this, right, if I did not have uh, anything in my main function, no memory would be created. All this code would never get executed, right? I would use no memory, except for maybe some code memory that uh, the 
the CPU would need to store in case I do this memory. Uh, but whenever I instantiated a point and I created this object, then the memory gets created. And there's actually a, a sequence of events that happens once you create an object uh, that we're about to talk about. But there, there's, there's a sequence of events that happens that has to do with giving you the memory and um, perhaps calling all kinds of events in, uh, in consequence of getting that memory. Yeah. And, and one of the big, and another big point of object-oriented programming is that uh, if you think of, if you have this point and let's say that you're, or, or that you have a line and you're trying to uh, find the distance, that's fine. And it's probably not that much work if you're trying to find the diff the distance of one line. But what if you had a hundred lines, what would you do then? And you, for each one of those, if you didn't do this <clears throat> in an object oriented way that every time you wanted to calculate the distance of the line, you'd have to do it separately. So the object oriented method allows you to construct as many lines or as many points as you want to. Uh, and then as EL was saying that when you can, when you actually create or construct an object of type point or of type line, then it comes with all of the built-in functionality such as get distance uh, that you're able to call on. So you can actually call on getting the distance of the line, uh, each line separately. So it's, it's best, it's object oriented is great when you need to construct loads of, uh, of types of objects that have a similar type of behavior to them. Yes. And uh, and it's uh, and it's actually uh, something people uh, will find out soon as they're uh, as you become like a more advanced object oriented user is there there are actually even advantages if you're not creating tons of the same things because what th there's some things that classes and structs and stuff like that can do which which can just automate all kinds of behavior for you especially and and that's obviously true when you're creating big things, right? Like, a, a, but if you're looking at, at something, uh, and we're probably going to talk about this concept quite a lot, but when sometimes you're building pieces of software that just need to connect without directly knowing about each other. Uh, and we're going to get more into that, but, but a, a classic example would be your DAW uh, that, and, and a plugin. So mm -hmm. for example, uh, you need to create, uh, th there, there's all kinds of, uh, of, uh, of uh, needed things to do so that Ableton will be able to run your plugin, right? There's, and this will not be, uh, be possible unless you've worked uh, in a certain way that, that's uh, enabled by object-oriented. And I'll discuss that uh, in a bit. Great. Uh, but, but yes, uh, uh, Josh is definitely right that once you're, uh, when you look at just one point, right? Or one line, let's go back to this point thing right? One point is really boring. Like there's no, it's just two, two integers, but a thousand points or a million points is something that's more realistic in software. And that's where, uh, that's where using uh, structs and classes can really uh, uh, increase what you're doing. Because if you're creating this thing called a point and let, let's for a start, get a, create a function called uh, debug point, right? That all it does is that it says, hey, stdc out x and then y, right? So if you have, uh, if you have just one point and you've created it here and it says, oh, p dot x equals 50, p dot y equals 100. And then you're like p dot debug point. Let's see that this worked. Great. So I got a debug function, right? But imagine that I wanted to print out like a thousand of those. So imagine that I wanted to create uh, something like, uh, uh, let's say I had, you know, let's say maybe this was created dynamically from like my mouse clicks or something. And maybe I had 10 points, point, points, and I had an array of 10 of those, right? And then I wanted to do something like 
maybe points one. Let's do a for loop, right? So maybe I can fill it with a for loop and do something like, uh, I can go over all the points. And then I can do something like, let's just do something random, like, uh, I don't know, maybe, yeah. maybe I'll start with, uh, I can do just start number, start number equals five, just some random number. And then I'll do like, uh, I don't know, point dot X equals start num, point dot Y equals start num number num, times five. And then I'm gonna, have start num be multiplied by three. This is just some random thing I'm doing to fill the points. And after I've done it, let's say later on, I wanna just print all the points. I can just do something like loop over the points, right? And then do point dot debug. Here you go. Oh, I made a mistake. I wanted to do this. There you go. I got weird numbers in my points array. And to debug everything, I all I had to do was just for loop and just call a function, right? Instead of just printing the X, printing the Y, printing the X, printing the Y. Uh, so working with containers is something that, that's made really easy working with functions or with member functions as they're called here. Because whenever I'm calling debug dot debug point, I'm actually calling a function that's only related to this particular point. So the one point in the for loop that, I've, uh, that I'm approaching. This is by the way, a modern C++ syntax, right? This is a modern range-based for loop that allows you to uh, iterate over a container. In this case, it's just a simple array of points and I can iterate over it um, and kind of call a function or maybe access the variables of each, each element. Cool. So, so, so far we're in, uh, we're, we're in still in basic land because we're still using points, right? Who cares about a point? Uh, but things can get much more interesting. So for a start, uh, what I'm going to do is talk about, <clears throat> so let me just remove all this code. Okay, so the next thing to do would be would be uh, to talk about uh, this thing called a class. So class is the same thing as a struct. Let's, let's bring this back. A class is the same thing as a struct, but the only difference between a class and a struct is the visibility of things. And what class does, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it's hiding details from the users of the class. So in this case, if I'm gonna create a point, right? And I'm gonna try doing, for example, p dot x equals five, I'm actually gonna get an error. Let's uh, bring up the code here. I'm actually gonna get an error here because in a class, by default, everything is hidden from the user of the class. And the, the first question people usually ask is, why would I want to hide the variables? Like the variables are mine. I wrote the variables. I want to be able to change the variables. Why would I want to do this? And this is where um, more interesting design talk is, is coming into play. Um, because when you're designing it, I'm, I'm going to turn off the code for a second before I'll show a bit more of the code. So when you're designing a piece of code, it's a lot like designing you know, a physical machine, right? Uh, imagine that you build a car, back to Josh's car example, right? And all the, all, and the engine and the, the, all, all the brakes and all the internals of the car would be right there in front of you inside the car. You can touch them. If you want to change the engine, it will be right there inside of your car, right next to the seat. You can touch it and you can change something and you can fill water or something if you wanted to. Uh, I feel like that would be quite a bad experience for the user of this car because uh, even though when you want to fix the car, you'd have a lot of flexibility, right? You want to you add water, you can just 
uh, take a water bo bottle and put it in the engine, or maybe you want to take oil and put it in the engine. Right next, it's right next to you. You don't even have to get up. It's so fast. Uh, but I, I feel I feel like most users of cars would argue that even though they need to open the you know the seat of the uh, they need to open open the cover of the uh, of the engine and kind of step out of the car and look at the car and stuff like that to to change oil they'd rather not have it around them when they're driving the car because it's annoying. It's not something they want to look at. It's pretty ugly. It takes space in the car. Like there's all kinds of reasons why you want to hide the internals of the car, right? And code is very much like that. I mean, pe uh, people who are coders like to believe that they want to know about all the details of all the code in the world. Uh, but the truth is code is really complicated. And if you had access to internals of all the code that you're working with, not even code that you wrote, even external code or whatever, then that means you are you will also have access to every possible bug in that code. Mm -hmm. And and a, a class, the concept of a class versus a struct is meant to uh, find a way to handle this. Basically, it allows the coder to say, hey, this part of the code is not to be accessed by uh, code that's outside of the class. And people have uh, people don't know how much of a powerful tool that is because if you have a bug, right? And most of code is solving bugs, right? And you have some bug in your class, which will happen. Uh, then if it's hidden from outside users, you can be sure that the solution to this problem is somewhere in the code of the class. It's not in any other code. It's in the code of the class. And uh, object-oriented is a lot about being able to reason about a problem, being able to talk about a problem, like a car, and not talk about uh, certain problems because they're hidden from us. Like if you have an engine problem, then you will have to go and open the engine and the solution will be in the engine. You, you as the driver cannot just uh, touch the engine from where you are. You will need... Uh, so you don't need to mess with it unless you abs you're absolutely sure you have an engine problem. Uh, instead, what you do is you push the gas, right? You have a little lever you, uh, or a little, uh, what's the word for it? Gas pedal. Gas pedal, you have a pedal and you press it and then the car goes faster. You have a start thing and the car starts. So you only have like very simple exposed controls to you, uh, the brakes or whatever. So you can only control things that are, uh, that, that you care about as the driver of the car, right? You're like, okay, I want to go faster. I want to go slower. I want to stop. I want to start. You care about that. And if it, if it's broken, so if you're going to press the gas pedal and the car won't work, only then you're going to either open the engine yourself or get a technician who understands the engine, right? Uh, and hiding the, the engine from you is a super important concept whenever you're a designer of anything, by the way, of, even of music. If, if, you're, if you're a music creator, if you're uh, a graphic designer, if you're a, a product designer, a lot about designing is what's in front, what's being accessed, what's, what's in people's ears or eyes or hands or whatever it is, and what's in the back and only left for those who care about. And even when you're a single coder, like uh, for example, a lot of the time I'm, uh, there's a piece of program that I'll do myself. Uh, if I will have all the complexity of all my program in my head at a certain time, my head will explode. I will not be able to, uh, to work. What I would rather do is solve a problem and make sure that, uh, that this problem is solved within the containments of this this file or class or whatever, and then I don't have to look at it unless there's a bug. That that will uh, help my peace of mind because uh, otherwise I will just go crazy. So let's uh, let's go back to code. Or uh, unless we have some uh, some questions or something before I uh, keep blabbing about. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions? I don't. I'm not really seeing any questions here. But if anybody has any, uh, please feel free to ask. Uh, we're here to help you and help answer your questions. 
Um, but yeah, just just going back to uh, what Eyal was saying while he's pulling up his code. Uh, so the concept of a class is that you have the public part, which is which is what's called the interface, uh, and the interface is exactly like you would see, like if you thought of a computer, what's in front of you, what what is it that you want the developer. Uh, which is in a lot of cases you to be able to do directly with uh, with the code, and then there are components that make up uh, the rest of the class that make up uh, the things that that are kind of like the engine that drives the things that are in the interface, the things that you're actually seeing, and all those things the the user doesn't need to see those. They're just they're just hidden away. So that's why those parts are in what's called a private section of your class. So you have the interface, which is what the uh, person using your class is going to be able to do with the class. Then you have this, uh, these other parts that are hidden away. Exactly. Uh, and and when, when we go into uh, more operations, we'll probably go into them pretty sh shortly, you'll see how much power you have uh, in, in things that are hidden. Like this is a lot of power, uh, surprisingly, right? So anyway, so, so the word class by default adds privacy. So by default, when you create a class, everything under it is private. When you create a struct, whatever my struct, right? But a struct uh, basically means that by default, everything is public. So that's, that's really the difference. Even in both a struct and a class, you can manually go back and say, oh, this part is public, this part is private. So you can say int x is public, int y is private. And the same exact thing goes to a class. So, so a class and a struct are identical. They're exactly the same in C++, except for the default privacy. So in a class, we had to... Uh, so usually we, 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 uh, we use the word class when we're about to manually uh, declare the public parts. Usually struct is for uh, simpler objects that, are, that have everything visible in them. And classes are for more complicated things where we want to start managing the, the, how things look. So, so let, let, let's give some example on how we would want to, um, <clears throat> how we would want to use this, right? So a classic thing that people do is something called a getter function. Uh, and that would mean that, for, for example, it, it, let's say you start with everything public, right? I have a, maybe I have a class, forget about a point, I just have a class called data, right? It's just some class that holds the data. And what it does is that it holds some number. I'm going to actually initialize it with five, right? Let's call it, uh, let's call it number. Right, this is, this is super boring. So let's say you, I just wanna print this number. All I can do is I can create a, an instance of type data, right? Let's call it data D. And let's say I wanna print out this number, right? So this is gonna be C out D. <clears throat> Sorry, D dot number. Let's print this and I'm getting the five. Great, super easy. I can access number, it's in my public variables. Uh, but then something that people do is that they say, I'm not gonna give you access to number. I'm gonna do a private here. You see this showed me an error immediately because I cannot access number. Uh, and instead I'm gonna give you access through a getter function. So I'm gonna do something like int get number and this function will return the number. This function is public, so I can access this function uh, uh, whenever I want from an out from the outside, but I cannot access the private member. So I have to do d dot get number, and this basically does the same thing. So the first question people ask is like, why did I have to go through all this? Why did I have to write another function? Hide this in private? Come on, ju I just want the number. Give me the number. Right, this just adds so much code compared to the struct version that had none of this and just this, and then just cold number, right? Uh, and the reason is what 
happens many times is that you decide that instead of giving number, you want to give something else. You, so instead of giving number uh, directly, right, you want to give a calculation. So let, let's uh, use a more, uh, a more uh, realistic use case, right? Let's say I'm going to give out something like, uh, something like, uh, Uh, bank account, right? Imagine this is my bank account, right? This has this something that that has the, the 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 money for each one. So each person has a bank account that shows all its money. I have int money. This is all my money. I have five money. I'm really rich. <laughs> so, right? You, so you must be an audio that, developer. <laughs> I'm an audio developer, right? So I do get money, and I'm giving back the money, right? So this is a bank account. Let's call it account. And then at some point I do, I do uh, account that get money, right? So, so this, for a start, this was the same thing, right? This is the, this is the, num the number of money that I have, the number of dollars or shekels or, or euros or whatever that I have, and I'm just giving them. But then, you know, what one thing somebody d might do at some point is that they might take a loan, right? So now, they have an, there's another variable here that's called uh, loans and loans is actually two so I'm, I'm i'm i have five but i'm owing the bank two right let's let's give this in more real terms i have like i have like a thousand and i owe the bank 500 and now when the bank decides to show me how much money i have it doesn't give me the money directly it says money minus loans Right, and this will give me the the how much I have other after I've, I will pay my loans, right? And now I will get the five hundred. Now, yeah, this and and even go. Like, uh, I'm sorry, I was, you're you're probably getting to this point, but one quick thing, another another obvious reason why you would not give people access to money as a variable directly is because then the user could actually change how much money you have in the account. Yes, but 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 even if but even if uh, it was fine for the user to change it, let's imagine that it's fine, right? Mm -hmm. The user would still want to know the when 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 they access this class, they want to know how much money they have overall. They don't care about the details of the money stuff like oh, we 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 paid we, we have this amount, but we're about to pay this amount. So they want the overall sum. They want the, you know, the, the, the bottom line of how much money they have. They might want the details. So we might expose the details if they really care about it. But most of the time, they just want to know how much money is in the account uh, if we're simplifying things. So even if, it, so even if the user has uh, changeability, the, the, the idea that we've made is now an expression so for example, if loans was not just one loan, maybe I have, uh, for example, I also have something like, uh, I don't know, maybe I have a savings account that the user just decided to add, right? And there's some other stuff here that has uh, 3,000, right? Now I can add the savings account as well. So this, uh, the, uh, the, now, the, the good thing about this, the user here, right, this function that says, that prints the user how much money, so let, let's say this is an ATM function, this function did not have to change. It did not have to know that the user now created a savings account, right? So I'm, as a, uh, as a programmer, I'm now very, I have a lot of freedom, right? So let's say I want to add more features. As long as I'm returning the correct number here, I can add more and more properties. I can add a savings account. I can add. A, I can have an array of saving accounts. I can add stocks, bonds. I can have all kinds of stuff. Eventually, all I have to do is tell the user how much money they have, and I'm okay. There's no bugs, right? And uh, this is something extremely, extremely powerful. You work with the public interface, as Josh said. You answer to it, and you define what your class does by that. And then the details are easy to change. Change is something that is really desirable in code. We always want to add features. We always want to solve bugs. We might want to change uh, internal systems because we have a performance problem, because maybe we changed some internal system that we're not 
tied to, like for example, maybe uh, the currency changed. So maybe uh, this is this used to be in, uh, I don't know, pounds, but now this is in euros or something. So maybe this change and I have to rechange all the calculations. But as long as I answer this, all of my users, that can be many, many users, really codes that I'm writing that are calling this, they're okay. They don't have to change. I, I can actually just solve this problem in one single file. Uh, and this is an important concept that it's, uh, that it's just uh, crucial to kind of say to people that are not used to thinking like that. They're used to thinking in a procedural way, right? You're solving one problem, then you're solving the other problem. Uh, and, but this gives you, this private thing, gives you a lot of control. Whenever I have, uh, uh, in my job, whenever we have a bug, the first thing I'm gonna, I'm gonna look is, oh, this thing changed. What are the public uh, variables or, or, uh, or uh, functions or methods? So I will immediately look for where, where and how can this function change? And when I know that this cannot change other than through this method or something, uh, I also have a lot of power. And we're about to see this once we add, add another function called the setter, right? So just like we can get something like get money, we can also uh, let the user uh, access things by creating a setter function. So for example, you have a set, uh, let's, let, let's imagine the user could just put in money in the, uh, in his savings account, right? So let's say I could do something like set savings amount. Uh, int amount. And this would mean something like savings account equals amount. So that's how I'm, uh, so for whatever the user wants to, they can go to my account and say set savings amount I don't know, 3,000, 30,000, right? They have a lot of saving and it will, they do this and it will get cal cal calculated in the get money function, right? It prints out 30,500. So that's great. But so this is, but this is really uh, identical to just touching the variable, right? Because I've, I've created a function, but essentially I'm letting the user go and change the variable. Uh, so this, uh, so this isn't such a great way of creating a good user interface or protection or something like that. However, it's very likely that once I've added the set function, I'm actually going to have additional uh, protection mechanisms in there. So for example, I can do that an amount, right? Can actually only come. So imagine that only comes from my money. So this only moves things that exist. I cannot move money uh, that doesn't exist, right? So instead of just bringing in money from uh, an imaginary source, I want to tell the user that they need to put in the money first, right? Bring in the real money. So what I can do is do something like, hey, if amount, right, is uh, larger or equals than the money, right, then it's gonna be equals to the money. So I'm gonna limit the amount to, uh, limit the, the amount that you can set in the savings account to the amount of money that you have. And while I'm doing that, I might actually uh, reduce this amount from your money. So maybe money minus equals amount, right? So instead of doing some dumb operation of setting a variable, I'm actually encapsulating all the logic that's needed to do this, including protecting from the user trying to abuse the system and adding more money than they have. Okay, so for example, if I'm gonna do the same thing now, set to 30,000 and I'm just gonna print this, uh, you can see that I actually have just 500 and I, I was not able to add, uh, add 30,000, right? Uh, and this is, a, this is an important concept because it's very, very likely that you will want to have this kind of protection around a variable. Either you want to limit the values or you might want to uh, have some threading stuff. Like you might want to protect this with a lock. Uh, you might want to call some, some what you call listeners. Like you might want to let other classes know that this changed. Like for example, uh, maybe there's uh, 
maybe when you move this, you want to let the user know on their iPhone app or mobile app that something has changed and you want to let them know that they've that you know one of their family members is tempering with their account so this function gives you a, an incredible amount of flexibility that was not available when you just changed the variable because there's no way now to change the savings without going through uh, these limitations that you've set it's just not possible you've limited by uh, putting everything in private very nice um, yeah so um, and, and there's uh, and uh, and uh, I can see uh, I can see some questions on the YouTube uh, on the YouTube uh, chat so let's see what the, what people ask over there yeah so so there is a question or a debate uh, mm -hmm. <clears throat> this is from low plane he says is there a reason you would use a getter function that isn't adding additional behavior. Just want to make sure there's nothing contextually specific to C++ I'm missing or best practices. All right, so this is a great question. And this is a question that gets asked all the time, right? And honestly, when I'm prototyping a lot of the time, uh, or even maybe by this design decision, you decide that you want to just work with the struct. This is a struct, just have the variable public, right? Mm. And touch it and there's no problem. Uh, the problem becomes once you start exposing this variable to a lot of other code. Uh, and what happens is uh, you you're, once you've exposed this, you've lost control uh, to moderate. So it's much, uh, it's much easier to, uh, to uh, remove moderation once everybody goes through the setter and getter functions mm -hmm. then uh then to add it once you have users As so uh, it's it's uh once you have users of your class uh for example if you're building a library or you're having some something that gets commonly used uh you'll see that very very soon you need to protect from misuse right mm -hmm. Uh, and and there's there's obviously some uh, stylistic question about this because if you all your struct has is uh, a bunch of unrelated data that you're kind of grouping together for easier passing or easier storing or creating an array, maybe you don't care so much about protection, right? Maybe it doesn't really matter. Maybe maybe protection is just redundant. Uh, but what I what you do find out is that uh, in many 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 cases uh, you will need the protection. Uh, the cl the most classic case would be threading. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very classic that you'll need to add a lock or a sync mechanism like a FIFO or whatever or an atomic for example. Atomic would be another another example around that variable. And once you add it, you have to change tons of users. Tons and tons of classes sometimes. Uh, it's very common that instead of passing like a getter, instead of passing the variable directly, you will actually uh, call another function that will get you that variable, right? So maybe you started with, uh, with absolute numbers, but then uh, you decided to switch to a factor of that number. So now every time you're not giving away the number, it's the number times a factor. Like, for example, in graphics, you maybe want to factor a zoom. Uh, that would be a classic one. Uh, maybe you want to factor in, uh, you know, the some offset of sorts. Like if you're going from left to right. So you want to add the, the position of the player on the screen, and then you decided to add a side scroll. So now the position is always this player's position plus the side scroll or something like that, plus the, the screen position. Uh, the, 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 uh, in, um, if, if you're running, if you have a game, right? At first, your, your power is just a power, but then your power also has your power up modifiers included in the calculation. And you have the curses that somebody put in. So it's now, so it's very, very common that data will change. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so I know that even though when you're when you're looking at code immediately, there's many reasons to not add add that. Right, you're just writing code, just make everything public. 
Uh, but my stylistic suggestion would be that once your classes have um, more than one variable that are connected, right? As in one influences the other, and that happens a lot, immediately go, do not expose them. So for example, if you have, uh, just like we've shown out, so we have the money, but the money is a few different accounts or a few different parameters. The minute you have more than one, it's probably a good thing that you've made this private and not expose it because otherwise you will need to make that connection everywhere. You will have to make sure that every user of the class knows about the connection. And, the, and a connection is something that uh, can get pretty intricate. So even if, so just to give you uh, a classic case, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, we have arrays, right? And almost every array in C++ starts with the index zero. But almost always when you ask for that index for display in the GUI, uh, you want it starting from one because users do not like zero, item number zero, because it's not very common. Users like item number one. So it's very common that instead of giving you the actual index of the array, you will have a calculation and add one when it's the GUI. Uh, so, uh, or maybe you will have, not even give out the number, but you will give out a string based on that number. So there's all these things that uh, you really want to make sure that you're, uh, you're encapsulated in your code. And this actually gets uh, more important when we uh, start to talk about the real use case of uh, object-oriented code, which is polymorphism, which is, and, and in, that's where you really start to see the advantage of working through uh, interfaces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one, I, I guess one thing that I've followed, and I think this is, if I remember right, I think this is the, the convention or the recommended way to do it is that you should default, when it comes to classes, you should default to private and only give people access to the data that they absolutely need. And with Eyal's use case with, with the bank account, it feels very simple and it feels like, why don't you just give access to the variable itself? Because it's really only doing, you can really only do two things with it. You can only look at what the value is or change the value. But when you start getting into larger programs, it's very, and you, and it's very easy to feel like, oh, I'll remember that. But when you get into larger programs, uh, what happens is that next thing you know, as you're going through your architecture, as you're building things and prototyping things out, next thing you know, you've taken this thing and now some other piece of data is now changing this data, but now it's changing it in a way that you haven't even realized and that, that has, that's completely messed up. Um, that's completely messed up the behavior that you intended. So that's the reason that even for simple pieces of data, it's better to have those defaulted as public, uh, as private rather, and then just give them the access that they need to, to ensure, because it's all about knowing what pieces of data are changing at what, at what time, especially when you're running, start running with multiple threads and different pieces of data are changing at different, uh, you know, points in time, then uh, it's important to know when your data is changing and what has access to what. So my recommendation is default to private and use getters and setters. Yes. And, uh, and it's, not, it's not even a matter of, um, I mean, again, if you're writing some structs, you can write structs. Uh, but, the, the, but the main thing is that you really have to understand what you're designing. And uh, it's, it's, it's so easy to, um, to kind of uh, underestimate the complexity of, of the, the data that you're, uh, that you're creating. Because uh, it's, uh, when, when we talk in a bit about uh, what interfaces are and why do we, we need interfaces, you will see that many times your users of your class might not even know which, like what are they doing when they're calling this function? It might do a bunch of other things. So maybe we should go into that discussion because it's become becoming interesting. Yeah. Uh, but, 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 but anyway, before that, I, I do want to show a few more simple use cases that are really uh, important. So, so uh, 
so there are uh, a couple of important things we have to understand with a class or a struct for that matter. Uh, there are a few other mechanisms that happen when we create a class. And one of those is that there's a special function that's called every time we create and destroy the class. Uh, and these are called the constructor and the destructor of the class. And these uh, functions are uh, probably one of the most important aspects of object-oriented programming because, well, let me just explain. So what, what, what is a constructor first, just to give uh, the, the basics, right? So let's have, let's say we have a class that's called, uh, we'll just call it a, I don't know, person or something just to, to, to start things out. Uh, so a constructor is a special function that looks like this. It's just, it, it's named after the class and it runs every time the class is instantiated. So for example, you can do something like uh, std cout person created. And if I have a person here, right? I create the person, that function is called, right? If I have an array of 10 persons, right? that function was called 10 times. And constructors and their, uh, uh, their counterpart, which is uh, a destructor. So a destructor is a function that co that's called when the, when the uh, class exits the scope and the class is being destroyed. So I'm gonna just name that person destroyed, right? So, you can see here, it was created 10 times and then destroyed 10 times. And this is a very, very important side effect that did not exist in C, for example, and really helps uh, working with classes because this is really uh, something that allows, first of all, it allows the class to initialize all kinds of variables that it has. So if you have variables that needs to be uh, calculated or something, this is the place to do it. So uh, for for example, uh, if a person would start out with uh, something like uh, int, let's say uh, they would have something like int birth year, right? Let's imagine I'm going to start with 1983 or something, and then they would have something like uh, int age, right? That would be their, or forget about their age, right? Imagine that they start with the yeah, let's do that. So imagine that you use something and they have an age, right? But I don't know their age until I know what year it is right now, right? That would be a, a good example, right? So to calculate the age, I need to know what's the current year. So then I, so, so I will know the current age of the person. I cannot know it until I know what's happening. So uh, one way to do this would be uh, as I'm creating person, right? Let's remove this. Close this. As I'm creating person, Path, uh, pass in a variable called something like current year, right? And then I can calculate age. So I can do something like uh, age equals current year minus birth year, right? And then I can do something like uh, C out. Uh, or maybe just have a function called, hey, uh, print age. And then I can do this person's age is age. And now if I create a person, I can do something like, hey, this is the person, Josh, and the current year would be 2020. And then I can say, Josh, print age. Right, so this person's age. I, I don't know if the, the, if that's your real age. I was just guessing, uh, but, but I'm anyway. younger, yeah. for the record. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, but anyway, so, so so the idea is that the constructor is a way for us to make sure that the variables are kind of have what they what they need. So we cannot 
get the age unless we know the, the current year. That doesn't make any sense, right? Uh, but there's other things that you can do with the constructor and destructor that makes uh, these functions really, uh, really powerful. So one uh, is that you can, you can uh, do some all kinds of logging. Like for example, you can say, oh, when you create this class, you log something, maybe you save to a file or load from a file, right? So you don't, so as the creator of the class, imagine that this always gets loaded from a preferences file. This can be loaded in the constructor, right? This can, uh, you can load all the details about a person from some database or from some file or something like that. So that's one thing that, uh, that you can use uh, constructor and destructors for. Uh, there are other things that you can use uh, like for example, if you have um, if you have like complicated things like like uh, like threading and stuff like that, or like uh, or like uh, memory allocations, which um, I haven't talked about yet, but stuff like that, that that would be ways where you can uh, where you can set those so you never have to know about this again. So uh, <clears throat> I don't, I don't want to go too much into pointers and stuff, but for many times you want to make sure that everything you do with like pointers is uh, encapsulated in the constructor and destructor classes so that the class is self-contained. So whenever I create a person, it will get uh, constructed. Whenever it leaves the scope, right, gets out of the of this area, the curly braces here, then the destructor will get called, code called and, uh, and everything will get notified. So that was something important to, uh, uh, to mention. So this is, so this is something, a, a very cool attribute, a very useful attribute that, um, that a constructor has. And actually something that I do a lot is to have classes that all they have is a constructor to set up other classes. So let me give you an idea on how this works. So imagine that I have a class called person, right? Or maybe I have some, just some struct, some boring struct. And this is actually the, gonna be the person. And it has something like an uh, birth year uh, and uh, age. And maybe it has something like std string name. Uh, std string. Let's, let's start with age and name. Age and name would be fine, age and name. So this is a person, right? Now, what I can do is have, uh, so imagine I wanna start creating, uh, creating lots, of lots of persons, right? So one way is to do something like person, Ayal, this is me, and my age is 35 and my, Name is Al. So this this could be quite a lengthy uh, equals, right? So this could be quite a lengthy process of initializing things, and sometimes you don't want this to be kind of littering your code. Sometimes, uh, if uh, the same types of uh, of people come back all the time, right? Uh, you might want to encapsulate the initialization of something. So I might want to do something like struct. Al, right? And I can inherit, we didn't talk about this so much, but I can inherit from person, which means that I will have everything that a person has, but I will have a constructor that does something like age equals 35, name equals Al. So this struct will inherit from everything this other struct has but it will add the special constructor function. And now whenever I wanna add myself to something, I can just do, hey, here's me. And this will uh, uh, call if we, uh, let's have a function here called something like uh, debug. Name, name, age. Right, so and I, then I can do something like e.debug and 
Let's see what happens. There you go. It gets you got created correctly. And this is gets uh, important because now I can reuse this AL class. Not that it's such an interesting class, but uh, this would be more interesting if this would have been, for example, a custom uh, oscillator or a custom processor of sorts or something that has or a custom filter that has all kinds of coefficients but these are all the same for each of the filters that I'm creating so now when I'm so if I want to have a collection of ALs right I'm, I'm very uh, narcissistic today so I have a 20 of myself and then I can just uh, this will uh, create the constructor for each one so I can do something like go to ALs uh, debug and here you go they're all the same right so uh when you have more complicated class like for example if i had a filter coefficient if i had all kinds of like complicated state management that gets repeats itself uh a component that has visual uh stuff like for example i could have a, a repeating visual um visual identifications here like colors or uh maybe positions uh, and then I'm, I'm able to just reuse this. So the constructor is a really, really useful way to uh, not repeat initialization. Initialization is a very, very boring thing in C and C++. Yeah. Awesome. Before I keep going forever and ever, do you have any other questions? I see some um, questions on the, on, the, uh, on the YouTube. I think I think that uh, I think they're pretty much all being answered. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think we're all good. We are all good. Yeah, I think yeah, this I is. There's yeah, an interesting question here, which is uh, which we should probably uh, get uh, get into pretty soon-ish. No, uh, how much time you want to keep going with this? Mm. Uh, but. Uh, there's a question of uh, uh, Alberto asks, so if you call the structure, uh, if you call the structure only if you have created them with new. So no, that's actually not, that's really important. So a destructor is always created, is always gets called as well as a constructor. Uh, that has nothing to do with new. New, uh, in, in, in back in the world of uh, uh, of older C++ maybe you kind you were kind of forced to call new in some cases but uh, but a class always gets a, a constructor even if I didn't specify one same with as a destructor by the way so even if I didn't write manually a constructor and destructor those will get called uh, yeah, it I, is important. I, there might be multiple constructors, and only one of the constructors will get called. So it's possible that I will have one constructor that takes that takes in no arguments, but another constructor that takes in, for example, the age, right? And age, and then age, and then the age will be whatever age get, gets passed in the function. So that's one way to do this. Uh, but so only one of these constructors will get called, but a destructor, even if I don't write the manual one, what will happen is the compiler will qu create a default one for you. And this is actually a very important concept when we're uh, working with objects, because uh, usually objects don't have just whatever an int. Usually objects would have other objects as members. So when you're uh, when you're creating an object, uh, it actually calls the constructors and destructors of the objects that it holds as members. So this is uh, something important. So let's say I had let's let's get rid of this AL thing. So just uh, let's say I have let's say I have some class called. Uh, <clears throat> I'm running out of names there, but before that you. Uh, Let's let, let, let's just call this member just for uh, just because I'm out of ideas. Entity. So, <laughs> entity. Right. Yeah, it... right. So, so it, it, this is just a class I'm creating to show yeah. how the the constructors and destructors. So, what this is going to do is this is going to get the C out member constructor. And by the way, while you're doing this, I think this went into a larger question of 
uh, when should a destructor explicitly be called? Right. So first of all, you never call the destructor explicitly, or at least shouldn't. Yeah. Uh, usually the destructor gets called automatically, which we're about to see, by the way, how, the, how this works. So we're about to experience this, the mechanics, right? So here's this thing. This thing has a constructor and destructor. It's really boring. And now let's say I have some class that's called, uh, let's remove all this stuff. So data object or something, some, some name that doesn't mean anything. And all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a member M in here. That's all I'm gonna do. Now I'm, now I'm gonna create the data objects member in my main function, call it object. And let's see what happens. I'm gonna call this. Hey, look at what happened, right? When this was created, right? What happened was this called the constructor of all the members, in this case, member. If member had other members, those constructors would be called. When data object got destroyed and it got destroyed automatically when I left the scope, I didn't have to do anything special. So whenever, uh, this last curly brace uh, arrived and data objects went out of business, it calls its own destructor, which in turn called the destructor for all the members, right? So I didn't have to call the destructor. There's no call to delete here or anything uh, manual like that. All I had to do was declare things in order that I want them created. And by the way, the order here uh, is important. So if I had... Uh, many members, like member M, N, X, Y, those will be initialized uh, in order. So first this, then this, then this, then this. Uh, this is sometimes important because sometimes we have members that depend on each other, which is totally fine. Uh, but we need to make sure that they're initialized in the correct order because their constructors is going to be called automatically and their destructors is going to be called in a reverse order. So constructors will be M, N, X, Y, and destructors will be Y, X, N, M, right? So the, so the, 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 the stack or the, the order of appearance uh, of declaration will also trigger uh, the different constructors and destructors. So you'll see I triggered the class, four constructors are called and four destructors are called. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. <clears throat> so uh, there's also a question there uh, when we're that deals with stuff like unique pointers and stuff like that. Uh, this is uh, an extension of that. A unique pointer and all kinds of pointer classes. Uh, all they do is encapsulate some stack behavior, right? So. Uh, a unique pointer, and we probably might need to uh, move on uh, to this topic maybe next time because this gets this gets a bit uh, a bit lengthy. But but uh, anything that deals with pointers is really doing the same things that we've done, but in a slightly uh, more uh, more involved way. So, but but uh, the the concept of a, of the constructor and destructor of a class is that you don't. Uh, when you create a class, you don't worry about was it created with new? Was it created on the stack? Was it created with a unique pointer or something? You don't worry about that. You define the, the life order of the class. So you define, so basically you're saying that when you create this class, all of these other variables are getting created in order, initialized. Maybe you uh, need some variables in order to create the class, like we needed the current year to create a person or something. Uh, so maybe you have some uh, some uh, requirements for the class. And then in your destructor, you write down anything that should happen when the class gets destroyed. Now, it's important to note that destructors is something that most of the time you don't manually write. Most of the destructors uh, are written for you automatically by the compiler uh, in modern C++ at least. So, uh, so even though there is a, still room for destructors in, in juice code and some other places where you need them, uh, most of the time, uh, 
if you have too much code in your destructor, uh, it's possible that you're doing something wrong because the, the modern convention is to have each uh, object release its own resources, what's called uh, RAII, release uh, acquisition is initialization. And the idea is that if you have a class and the class has other members, each of these members should release itself automatically without the need for a manual destructor that takes care of like pointers and stuff like that. Great. I think that's a good place for us to wrap up. <laughs> yes. Gives, gives plenty of, uh, plenty of things for people to, to think about. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Eyal. Are there any other questions here before we sign off for the day? And, um, and we're going to do these, we're going to do these more often as well because, uh, we enjoy doing them and, uh, and we're, we're all learning C plus plus as well. So it's a continuous, it's a continuous learning process for us. And, uh, these also help us out in learning, uh, these things better. So yes, thank you to everybody that has tuned in today. Uh, be sure once again, to join our community at the audioprogrammer.com forward slash community. Uh, anything else before we sign off? Yeah. Uh, no, I, I do realize that I, I see in the chat that there, there's some uh, there's some people here who are more of uh, more of you know definitely more of experts mm. and they ask some, some really good uh, questions and we'll, we'll try to cover some of, you know some of these obviously not all of them because it's uh, it's a big topic. Uh, I was trying to keep it uh, relatively simple for now, uh, just because uh, it's hard to wrap your head around. A more complicated topic, right? So, because when we get to probably in the next stream, get to you know um, uh, polymorphism and stuff like that, uh, it's hard to talk about that concept without understanding the the flow of the of the very basic mechanics of sorry of classes and structs uh, because it's all it's all kind it's all kind of relates to each other. And one of the uh, common things that we get in the um, in the in the Discord group is questions about, hey, I'm I'm uh, I'm trying to you know load this object right like a, a value tree state or something right like uh, audio processor value tree state, and I can't get it to initialize like getting a compiler error or something right so there's there's all those things that if you don't uh, grasp the mechanics of how how to uh, create an instance of a class. Uh, or maybe how to derive from it if it has an interface, stuff like that. It's very hard for you to talk about more complicated topics like a plugin or mm. like a, like a component or th things that are they're, they're kind. Of, all these concepts are kind of tied into the basic understanding of uh, this mechanic of you know uh, series like the class gets called, a series of constructors gets called, then a series of destructors, maybe a, maybe a private and public. Uh, variables that have side effects, mm -hmm. for example, like just like we talked about, so usually the get and set stuff are not straightforward. There's some side effects of them. So they're uh, usually when you look at a library, those have been created for a reason, mm -hmm. right? So if you look at juice, a lot of the variables will be protected by a getter and setter because they have all these side effects that you might not think about. Yeah. And, and another thing with class, with learning about uh, classes, object-oriented programming is that it gets into a lot of the stuff that you need to know in order to use a lot of the juice, uh, a lot of the concepts in juice, stuff like abstract classes, pure virtual functions, uh, things like that. All those terms that you've heard throughout all of these tutorials that, uh, that, that we've been doing the past couple of years, all of this stuff really comes down to understanding classes, inheritance, as Eyal said, polymorphism, um, all of that stuff really is, those are the building blocks of really being able to uh, work with uh, and use juice. So. Yes, uh, and uh, one thing I wanna say, there's one question there on the chat. Uh, I, I can't pronounce the name because it's, I think it's not in English, at least the letters are not. So, mm. But the, the question is, is it possible to initialize a person object with a YAL constructor? 
Yeah, that is a great question. I, I, I'm kind of intentionally not going into there just because we didn't talk really about what it means to inherit. I just showed it, I kind of skimped over it. Uh, so so th this is a great question, by the way. And, and the, 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 the initial answer is no, but you could do it if you have some more complicated mechanism there, which we'll probably yeah. talk about next time or maybe tomorrow or later this week. Yeah. Great stuff. Um, great. Well, thanks. Thanks once again, Eyal, for your time. And uh, yeah, as Eyal was saying, we're going to be doing some more of these because I really enjoy them and it helps me learn. So uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I hope, uh, I hope that everybody that tuned in on the other platforms enjoyed it as well. It's the first time that we've actually done something like that. And it's, uh, it seems to be going well. So, um, yeah, we're going to sign off and we will see you again soon. Right. Bye. Bye.